Good morning, members and friends of Calvary United Methodist Church. We are pleased to have you with us this morning as we continue our series on hearing from the prophets of God from the Old Testament. We are delighted that you are worshiping with us either in person or online, and we welcome you both ways as we worship God and seek to glorify Jesus Christ together. Our opening hymn will be, uh, for those of you in the sanctuary, number 61, Come Thou Almighty King. We will sing the first two verses together. Um, these verses give some reference to the names of God that um, were revealed to Daniel in his book. And so we will welcome and invite Jesus to be among us this morning. Number 61, Come Thou Almighty King, verses 1 and 2. King, help us thy name to sing, help us to praise, Father all glorious, or all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days. Come thou in word, gird on thy mighty sword, our prayer attend, come and thy people bless, and give thy word success, spirit of holiness, on us descend. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from various verses in chapter 1 of the book of Daniel. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them the names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I understand that you are going through some tough times right now, very difficult times. I understand that there's a, a virus that is you know, raging through your country, and in its wake it is leaving illness and even death. And as a result of that uh, terrible virus, government officials have taken action. They have closed businesses temporarily. They have asked people to stay at home, to wear masks. They have limited gatherings. And because of that, many 
businesses have shut their doors permanently. And many people have lost their jobs. And that has caused terrible financial difficulties for the economy and for personal income. And then add to that uh, the racial tension that has boiled over and has led to violent demonstrations, destruction, even loss of life. And then even on top of that, there are things that you are going through personally in your life, troubles that you're wondering if you're going to get through them. And when you add all of these troubles together, uh, I can't blame you for asking the question, where is God in all of this? My name is Daniel, and I think I have an answer to that question. You know, a lot of bad things have happened to me during my lifetime, enough that I have really had my trust in God tested. And what I've discovered is that, that God is still with us in those tough times. For some reason, uh, he thinks it's, it's better to walk with us through those tough times than it is to help us avoid those tough times altogether. And so, I think perhaps if I share a little bit about my life, you may see the answer to your question. Now, I mentioned that I had troubles in my life, but my life started off very well, actually. I was born into the nobility of the people of Judah, and I lived in Jerusalem. That was the most important city in Judah. As a, as a member of the nobility, I received all the benefits that came with nobility. I had wealth. I had re good reputation. I had an excellent education. You might say that, that I was among uh, the favored people of the favored people of God. It would have been great if that would have lasted, but alas, it didn't. When I was but a teenager, I went through a terrible time. God announced that he was judging Judah for her idolatry, for rejecting God. And so God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to come and besiege the city of Jerusalem. And then he overpowered it, and he destroyed it, and he sacked it, and he took many of the people into exile in Babylon. And I was one of those that he took into exile. Imagine, imagine if you will, being a teenager and ripped away from everything that was familiar. You're taken away from your home and you're, you're, you're taken to a, an unfamiliar land with unfamiliar language and unfamiliar culture. Think of the, how devastating that is. Disorienting. And I'll admit, I, I struggled with my feelings. I felt like God had somehow abandoned us. You can't help those feelings. And yet, and yet, I trusted God. I held on to my faith in God tenaciously. Because in reality, that's all that I had. That was my sure foundation. Everything else had been taken away. As it turned out, Nebuchadnezzar had a plan for some of us. His plan was to take the best and the brightest, the healthiest of, of the exiles, and to make them administrators in his government. Very important officials. And so he went through a re-education program. He wanted to have us erase all of our memories of our homeland and to be indoctrinated into the culture of the Babylonians. 
And so he gave us new names. And he gave us an education. He taught us the language and the culture of the Babylonians. And then he fed us from his own table, rich food, food and, and wine. We really had it made. But I was, I was concerned. You see, this food and this wine, I, I sensed that they were, they were offered to idols. And because of that, I, I didn't want to be defiled by this, this food and this wine. So I talked it over with three of my friends, and, and we agreed that we did not want to be defiled by this food. So we went to the, the chief steward who was in, in charge of giving us our daily ration of food from the king's table. I was the spokesman, and I said, please, sir, we do not want to have to eat the food of the king because we are afraid that it will defile us. It's against our religion. Now, the steward, he was actually sympathetic. He liked us, and, and he wanted to, to, to comply to our request, but, but he was afraid. Indeed, he was very afraid because he felt that if we didn't eat that food and we somehow looked inferior to everyone else who was eating the food, that when Nebuchadnezzar saw that, it would be off with the steward's head. Well, I was sympathetic to his plight. And so I made a deal with him. I said, look, for 10 days, just 10 days, just feed my friends and me grain, just vegetables and, and water. And at the end of those 10 days, inspect us and see how we stack up against those people. And so he agreed. And for 10 days, he fed us only vegetables and water. And at the end of those 10 days, we didn't measure up to the rest of the people. <laughs> no, we exceeded them. We were healthier than they were. And when, when Nebuchadnezzar came and he inspected uh, the people, he saw that my friends and I were heads and shoulders above everyone else and that we had learned our lessons well. And so he made us high officials. We, we shot right up to the top of the ladder. And I tried my best to be a good administrator. I, I, I tried to live with a sense of loyalty to my new country, even though I felt exiled. Of course, when things went against my loyalty to God, I, I had to reject those other things. Loyalty to God was much more important than loyalty to the government. So I, I, I continued my, my daily rituals. And the most important thing was that daily I came to God in prayer. Three times a day. I would go to my second floor of my house and open the windows that faced Jerusalem. And I would pray. And that ended up getting me into some trouble. It happened this way. The, uh, during my time in the administration, Nebuchadnezzar wanted to set up a government where he had governors throughout his province. And so he set up 120 of these governors to rule over his territory. And then he set up a few of us to be administrators over them so that they had to report to us. And then he had a plan because he was, because he was favorable toward me that he was going to make me a top official, that I would 
be the one that everyone would report to. Well, as you can imagine, the people that, or other administrators, weren't too happy with that. So several of them became very jealous. And so they looked for opportunities to trip me up, to get me in trouble with Darius. They looked for opportunities to see corruption in me, but they couldn't find it. Because I was very careful to to be the best administrator that I could be. I wanted to be loyal to this new government. And so I was very scrupulous in doing what was my responsibility. I was honest. So finding nothing that they could bring against me as far as charges in my work, they decided that they would find something that would pit my loyalty to God against my loyalty to the government. And so they found just the thing. They went to Darius, and they said, Oh, king, we want you to make a law, an irrevocable law, a law that says that anyone who prays to anyone, divine or human, apart from you, that they will be thrown into a den of lions. Well, for some reason, Darius thought that was a good law. And so he signed it into effect. Now, I quickly became aware of that law. And I knew that I couldn't obey that law. It would run against my beliefs that I owed my ultimate loyalty to God. I had to pray only to God. And so I continued my ritual. I would go up every day, three times a day, open the windows facing Jerusalem, and I would pray to God. And of course, because I did this with the windows open, the conspirators saw that I was doing it, and they had plenty of evidence. And so they went to the king, and they said, King, didn't you make a law that people were only supposed to pray to you and not to other beings? And here this Daniel is is blatantly disobeying that law. He is praying three times a day to his God. Now, Darius, he, he really liked me. He, he cared about me. I was a good official. And this caused him such distress. He, he, he looked for opportunities to overturn the law. He was trying to figure out a way out, but he could not figure anything out. If he didn't, if he didn't enforce this law, it would, it would make him look weak. And so he said, you can enforce the law. And so he sent people to come, and they, and they took me by force, and they dragged me from my home, and they threw me into a pit of lions. And they closed the, the opening with a stone. And there I was. No one could get in. And I could not get out. The king was in great distress. He said, Oh, Daniel, may the God that you pray to, that you pray to protect you among these lions. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a den locked up with a bunch of hungry lions. But I can tell you, it's not a pleasant situation. First, I was very nervous. But then a calm swept over me. And the reason for the calm was that there was a a being, an angel, who appeared. 
And he appeared between me and the lions, and he was a, a very imposing figure. And even those fierce, hungry lions were cowed because of him. So I prayed to my God. I prayed with thanksgiving. And I slept peacefully that night. I learned afterwards that it wasn't so for the king. He was in great distress. He, he couldn't sleep all night. He was tossing and turning, pacing back and forth, hoping beyond hope that I would survive that night. And at the very break of day, he ran to the den and he called in, Oh, Daniel, did your God save you? And I said, O oh, king, live forever. He did. My God, shut the mouths of the lions. And so, Darius, he, he had them remove the stone, and they lifted me out of that pit. And then, Darius offered justice in the way that only people of my time during Darius' reign experienced. He threw the conspirators in the pit and their wives and children. And they barely hit the ground before the lions tore them to pieces. It was a terrible justice. Well, as you can see from what I've told you so far, I was an administrator. And you might be wondering, why is this man who is an administrator speaking during a time when prophets are telling about prophecy speaking to you today? Well, that's a fair question. And the answer is, not only was I an administrator, but God gave me visions of what would happen in the future, the immediate future, and in the great future. Visions began when, during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, he gave me a vision that enabled me to interpret a dream that he had. A very disturbing dream for him. But it turned out to be good for him, and not so good for people down the line. And then God gave me a vision to interpret some cryptic handwriting on the law, on the wall during Belshazzar's reign. Very disturbing for him. But the visions that, that really have uh, import beyond the time that I was in began during the first year of Belshazzar's reign. During that time, on that first vision, I saw beasts, four beasts that, that represented four different governments, four different powers that were ruled over the earth. Very powerful, but they would not last forever. You see, I, I saw that the Ancient of Days, the Almighty God, took his throne and when he was on the throne, he received a person who, who was like a son of man. And he was coming on the clouds. And he came, and the Ancient of Days gave him power and dominion and authority over all things. And this, this son of man would rule forever. And then, in the third year, of Belshazzar's reign. I had another vision, and this vision included the, the governments of Medea, Persia, and Greece. They would be very powerful in their time. And one would come out of those that was a very terrible ruler indeed, and he would cause destruction and destroy many. 
And then in the first year of Darius' reign, I was, I was praying and reading the scriptures as I normally did. And I was reading the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah had prophesied that, that the people of Judah would go into exile. And that had come true. And I was reading the part in Isaiah where he talked about the exile lasting 70 years. And I realized that we were nearing the end of those 70 years. And then I was filled with a strange dread because I realized that, that we weren't ready, that we were still a sinful people. And I knew that we had to get ready. And so I, I dropped to my knees and I prayed, out, prayed to God. I poured out my heart. I asked for his forgiveness for his people. I asked for his mercy. And as a result of that prayer, he sent me a vision of what was going to go on after that. He sent me a vision that the Messiah would come. And this vision was so precise that it, it really told exactly when the Messiah would come, exactly when the Messiah would be crucified. It was amazing. And then, in the first year of Cyrus the Persian, I had another vision. And this vision was of a great conflict it was going on in the spiritual realm. And this conflict was having an effect on the physical realm. It was a, a terrible conflict. And it would cause many troubles on earth. And these troubles would cause destruction. They would cause death. Terrible days. But in the end, in the very end times, People would rise from the dead, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting shame and destruction. It was a terrible vision, and yet it gave such hope. Now I know these visions that I had were visions of, of things that many have been fulfilled in the past. I wish I, I had time to give you the details. I wish I could show you all of the visions that I had, but time doesn't permit me. I encourage you to read these in my book, the book of Daniel. But for now, I just want you to know that, that these visions do still speak to you today. Even though some of these visions have already taken place, others in the end times have not. And you need to be prepared. The visions that I had still speak to you today. And this is what I think they are saying. Even though you are going through tough times right now, unprecedented tough times. God is still in control. God is with you through those tough times. And God will get you through those tough times if you trust him and if you lean on him. No matter how powerful the forces are that are, are arrayed against you, God is more powerful. And the visions that I had that have already taken place ought to give you confidence that the visions that haven't taken place yet will indeed take place. Your Messiah has come. 
He came and he died on the cross to take your sins away. And he rose from the grave to give you power over sin and death. And that should give you confidence that, that as he promised, he will come again and he will reign forever. He will conquer the kingdoms that have risen against him and have risen against you. God is sovereign. He is sovereign over history. He is sovereign over nations and rulers. He is sovereign over coronaviruses. He is sovereign over any illness or disease that you will face. He is sovereign over any circumstance that you face. No matter what trouble you are going through, God is with you, and he will protect you if you trust him. And so if right now you feel like you are in a pit with a dozen hungry lions waiting to devour you, know that God is there, and he will shut the mouths of the lions. He will be with you. He will see you through your tough times. Let us pray. Oh God, oh ancient of days, we thank you for the message that you are with us in our tough times. I even thank you for the tough times that remind us that we are we are dependent on you, that you are our sovereign and almighty God. So I pray that as we go through these difficult times, as we face this pandemic, as we face turbulent social issues, as we face the personal issues that cause us trouble, that you will continue to remind us that you are with us that you are protecting us, that you are our shield and our defender. Holy and almighty God, help us to cling to you. Help us to daily come to you in prayer so that we can experience your presence and be reminded that you are sovereign over all creation. So Lord, thank you even for our troubles. Thank you for your great and awesome might that protects us. We pray this in Jesus' name. And in his name, we pray the prayer that he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, and through whom also he created the world. He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Daniel was given visions that frightened him. We are given Jesus Christ to be our vision. Number 451, let's sing together, Be Thou My Vision, and make it a prayer today. Mm -hmm. 
Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou and thou only first in my heart. Great God of heaven, my treasure thou art. Great God of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my 